Span Development of the Brain and Behavior. This is chapter seven in your textbook. We're gonna we're gonna give birth to a baby. We're gonna impregnate someone in, someone to give birth to the child and then uh, grow them up. So let's go ahead and get started. Lifespan development. The brain contains about 100 billion neurons and an equal number of glial cells. It's estimated that there may be as many as 100 trillion connections within the brain. While genetics play an important role in creating the brilliant creatures that each and every one of us may be, the environment guides the process of development. The most rapid brain growth is during gestation but it continues to expand markedly through the language acquisition years. For an egg to be fertilized and come to term, everything has to be perfect. The sperm must have a, its full complement of 23 chromosomes and will not be able to swim through the cervix, up through the uterus, and into the fallopian tube to penetrate the ova unless it is perfect. The ova must have its full complement of 23 chromosomes and be in the right position when the sperm reaches it. For implantation to take place, the uterine wall must be ready for implantation. The zygote must implant near the top of the uterus. Adequate vascularization must take place between the embryo and the uterus. Growth and, growth and cell division must take place in a continual and balanced pattern. As soon as the sperm penetrates the ova, the structure becomes a zygote. Within 12 hours, the single cell divides into two cells. Within two weeks, the zygote becomes an embryo and will divide into three distinct layers. <clears throat> okay. The nervous system develops from the outer layer of the three layers, the ectoderm. The ectoderm forms into a flat oval plate. The cells of the plate do not grow at the same rate, and a groove develops. This groove is known as a primitive streak, and this will become the central nervous system. As the cells continue to divide, the groove slowly grows into a neural tube. The front or, or anterior portion of the tube divides into three structures that will become the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. By the eighth week of gestation, the fetus has developed all the rudimentary organs in its body. The brain at this time takes up one half of the fetus's mass. The brain will continue to grow through the teenage years. Uh, it actually grows uh, into your mid-twenties, so your brain is continually changing. Ner nervous system development takes place in six stages. Neurogenesis, the formation of neurons, Cell migration, movement of neurons to form nerve cell populations. Differentiation, development of distinctive types of neurons. Synaptogenesis, development of synaptic connections as axons and dendrites grow. Neuronal cell death, selective death of neurons. And synapse rearrangement, refinement of synaptic connections. If you understand, if you under, have understood everything that I've said thus far, your brain has developed normally. Your, your brain is, is uh, it's doing a pretty good job. Some of this is fairly complex, but the reality is that, uh, that humans, of course, in today's society, uh, there are a lot of very complex things that we have to do and have to understand. In the past, of course, humanity wasn't quite that complex. Uh, there wasn't that much information for uh, individuals to accumulate. And because our life has become more and more uh, complex, that's why we have evolved into the individuals that we are today. And potentially, if you think about it and you pr can project into the future, we're not the end point. This isn't the end point of humanity. Uh, humanity may get even more and more brilliant uh, more and more uh, uh, able to uh, accumulate more and more information, as amazing as that may seem. The first stage of nerve system development is neurogenesis. This is when the nerve cells are produced. Nerve cells uh, themselves do not divide, but the nerve cells, the, the pre-nerve cells, 
which are located in the inner layer of the neural tube, do divide and create a closely packed layer of cells called the ventricular zone. The cells of the, of the ventricular zone continue to divide and give rise to daughter cells, which also will divide. All the body's neurons and glial cells are derived from ventricular mitosis. Neural cells will be completely developed by birth. Each neural structure in the brain will develop at the same time in gestation for all humans. Neurons of the developing, and this is one of the reasons why you, uh, if you see a four-year-old uh, four in, in, um, in the Sudan, or and you see a four-year-old in Japan, and you see a four-year-old uh, in the uh, wilds of uh, New Guinea, and a four-year-old on the, on the Navajo Nation, and a four-year-old in New York City, they're, they're all about the same, all, almost identical. And it really doesn't matter whether they are from, uh, they dress them up in silk or they wear leaves, it really doesn't matter. They all look and seem as if they were uh, very similar to one another. During the cell migration stage, the cells of the ventricular layer begin to move where they will end up. In humans and other primates, by birth, all the neuronal cells will have found their way to where they will always be. Some neurons will creep down glial cells, known as radial glial cells. Neurons can either move down the glial cells or jump from one to the next. This migration is guided by various chemicals called cell adhesion molecules. The cerebrum is formed by wave after wave of neurons, till the entire cerebral cortex is formed. So you can see that uh, all, all of this movement, all of these changes that are taking place, extremely important. And it's very, very important uh, that the child uh, continues to um, uh, eat, the pro eat proper foods or to consume uh, proper foods. Now, the reality is that this is all taking place in the womb, so it's the mother that has to do this. So if she, if she um, skips a meal, if she starts uh, shooting up with heroin, uh, smoking pot, uh, all of that can, and, or especially smoking cigarettes because it's a vasoconstrictor, all of these things, um, the baby, the only way the baby can get uh, sustenance is through the, its blood. So if the mother does something that uh, interferes with this uh, for a, a short period or even a long or, or a long period to a long period of time, uh, there is always a possibility that uh, the baby will not develop completely normally. Once the preneuronal cells reach their destination, genes in the cells begin to make the proteins that are required by neurons. At this point, the neurons begin differentiating into the distinctive neurons of the region that they are in. Most neuronal cells differentiate through induction. They take on the task of all their neighboring cells. Some cells are undifferentiated cells and will differentiate into any cells that they are close to. And these are known as stem cells. Now, stem cells can be extremely important. And of course, we've tried to work with stem cells, not in the United States, because there was a law passed during the George W. Bush administration that, uh, that, you, that stem cell research was, uh, was not allowed in the United States. But there is stem cell research in other, in other countries. When neurons migrate to their final destination, they start the process of synaptogenesis. Axons and dendrites begin to web out, making contact with the cells that they are going to, to be responding to. This is done through swollen ends of dendrites and axons called growth cones. The growth cones reach out using fine filaments, filopodia, or plates, lamellopodia. Growth cones are, are drawn by chemical signals called chemoattractants. Growth cones can also be repelled by ke chemical signals called chemorepellents. As adults, we maintain synaptogenesis structures, dendritic uh, growth cones, axonic uh, chemoattractants, and chemorepellents. 
Synapses can form rapidly on dendrites and, dendr and dendritic spines. The number of spines increase rapidly after birth and are affected by experience. Neuronal cell death, apoptosis, is crucial to, the brain, uh, to brain development, especially during the embryonic stages. Neuronal cell death ranges from 20 to 80 percent, varying from region to region of the brain and spinal cord. An area needs only to so many neurons and synapses, and as the area grows, more neurons than are needed flood into the area to ensure that the most perfect neuronal structure and synapse are created. The cells that die are self-selecting to die. They are committing suicide. All cells carry a death gene that causes a sudden influx and release of calcium ions that causes the mitochondria to release a protein called Diablo. Diablo, of course, is Spanish for devil. Uh, Diablo binds uh, the inhibitors of apoptosis proteins, or the IAPs, that have been inhibiting a family of proteins called caspases. The caspases are proteases, or enzymes, that dissolve protein. The caspases break down the protein and the DNA of the neuron. Normally, Diablo is inhibited by BCL2. Cells that are able to make proper and adequate uh, synaptic connections are the ones that live while those that don't die rather than make a poor connection. Chemicals that enable proper growth are called neurotropic factors. <clears throat> and this is a joke. Integrating signals hinting at his, his obsolescence, George undergoes apoptosis and his brain explodes. His head explodes. <laughs> Scientists have discovered a substance that promotes the growth of spinal ganglia that they call nerve growth factor. If a technique could be developed to use NGF effectively, spinal injuries could be repaired back to normal function. With time and experience, some synapses disengage and other synapses are formed. This process is especially prevalent during cell death in the area, in the area, refining the remaining synapses to provide optimum connections. While neurons in glial cells develop from the same source cells, scientists don't know what informs the cells to end up as one or the other. While neuronal uh, growth takes place almost exclusively before birth, glial cells have their greatest growth surge right after birth and continue to grow throughout life. The glial cells provide myelin for the axons of the neuron. The myelin protects, feeds, and accelerates the electrical response on the neuron. Myelination allows people to walk with coordination and the brain to process information rapidly. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease that affects select individuals. The condition allows the immune system to attack the myelin of the neurons and leave gaps in the structure that slows the neuronal response. Intrinsic factors in the development of the nervous system deal with genetic factors that allow for proper development. When genetic aberrations occur, it can cause abnormal brain development. Tay-Sachs disease causes a, dis a destruction of neurons that eventually results in death. It has been identified as a flaw on the 15th chromosome. Down syndrome causes intellectual disability and body abnormalities. It has been identified as an extra chromosome on the 21st pair. Extrinsic factors include malnutrition, fetal alcohol syndrome, hypoxia-induced intellectual disability. The sum of the intrinsic factors are referred to as the genotype. The genotype plus the extrinsic factors represent an individual's phenotype. When mutations take place in a species' genetic history, the mutation most often creates a maladaptive circumstance. But on the rare occasion when the mutation is actually useful to the species, the mutation will be reproduced in the offspring. Experience is an important factor in brain development. The human brain is only one-fourth its adult size at birth, yet few new neurons are added. The reason for the exceptional growth is due to dendrite growth and myelination. 
dendrite growth and myelination are induced by experience with the various muscles and sensory organs of the body. One form of extrinsic stimulation causing a problem is amblyopia. Also called walleye and lazy eye, children with the problem have a misalignment of the balance of their binocular vision. If left untreated by age 7 or 8, the suppressed eye will totally blind. While treatment in childhood will result in perfect vision, when the problem is corrected in adulthood, the eye does not gain acute vision. This is because when the problem is allowed to remain the same over time, the neural connections in the brain from the weak eye are not as intricate. Understanding of amblyopia and other asymmetrically balanced neural connections has been studied by performing binocular deprivation research on laboratory animals. Researchers have discovered that sensory organs have a sensitive period when the neural development is crucial for stimulation to induce proper dendritic connections. If stimulation doesn't occur by this time, recovery to a normal state is impossible. Um, let me tell you a quick story. I have a, a niece who uh, had a child, and, and she was she was kind of lazy with the child. She didn't really want to take care of the child all the time. So a lot of times she would put the baby, uh, lay the baby on the couch, uh, lay her head on the pillow, and, and prop a bottle up in her mouth, and uh, turn on the television. So the child watched a lot of television. Well, the problem was that she always laid her on her left, her right side. Uh, so the eye that she was watching television, she only was watching television with her left eye, not with her right eye. Her right eye was covered with the, with the bottle. She couldn't see television with her right eye. Well, she did this enough so that the, the child developed amblyopia. And, of course, she had... Uh, she was in denial, and she didn't do anything about it, and she didn't do anything about it. And, and uh, uh, my sister went down. She lived in Minneapolis at the time. And my sister went down and tried to, and said, I think there's something wrong with this child's eye. And, and finally, she admitted, yeah, there, must, there probably is. I'll take her in. And she put it off and put it off and put it off. And eventually, the, the end of the story is that, that because of the way that she treated this child and the way that uh, uh, that she put off uh, trying to do anything with, with the individual. Uh, she was, uh, she had walleye. She uh, had amblyopia. And uh, to this day, she has that problem. Uh, because she didn't, she didn't take care of the problem. Really not the smartest thing in the world to do. To understand why people tend to have dominant eyes, it must be remembered that each eye represents millions of receptors vying for attention in the brain. When one eye receives more stimulation than the other, some of the synapses in the brain connected to the overstimulation eye, understimulated eye, become weaker. While most synapses do not fluctuate in their strength with stimulation, some do. These synapses are known as Hebbian synapses. Seventy-five years ago, the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States was phenylketonuria, or also known as PKU. Two percent of the population carries the recessive gene. The gene controls the enzyme that breaks down phenylalanine, an amino acid, in protein. Because the enzyme does not break down uh, the phenylalanine, a toxic level collects in the brain and destroys brain cells, and that's the phenylketonuria. <clears throat> so when I was working in the hospital, <clears throat> when I first started in the 1970s, this was the number one cause of uh, intellectual disability in the United States. And we had to check every baby that came in. After their first, um, after their first feeding, uh, their first intake of milk, we would check them to find out if they had an elevated PKU le level. And, of course, it became very important because uh, if this individual would develop uh, or would not develop intellectually. And so they would have a, uh, an intellectual deficit uh, if we didn't uh, do the test properly. So it was 
uh, not always easy to get the blood and it was <laughs> and the test is not that easy so you know this is all quite important so the individual that could really get the blood out of the baby that was the one and you had to do it with a heel stick because the baby's only two days old anyway I was really good at getting blood from babies Williams syndrome is a relatively rare genetic abnormality that causes neural and facial abnormalities as well as mild intellectual disability. Research indicates that Williams syndrome is caused by an incomplete chromosomal structure on the seventh chromosome. These individuals have normal linguistic ability but difficulty in learning by observing. Individuals with Williams syndrome have very characteristic facial features, broad foreheads, small eye openings, uh, low nasal bridge, uh, nostrils that point forward, a uh, long area between the nose and the upper lip, uh, full cheeks, large downturned mouth. And this is the difference between somebody with Williams syndrome and somebody who is normal or who doesn't have Williams syndrome, I guess. As you can see, the cerebellum is much, lar is much larger. Um, the occipital lobe is much larger. <clears throat> it's much smaller on the individuals with uh, Williams syndrome than somebody that doesn't have Williams syndrome. And that's what they look like. As interesting as that is, now you might say, well, that's, that's these individuals' brothers. But the reality is they're, they aren't related. They just all have the same genetic problem, Williams syndrome. Down syndrome is a condition caused by the addition of an extra chromosome among the 21st pair of chromosomes. This abnormality can cause mild to severe intellectual disability and various physical anomalies, heart malformations, and brittle arteries that lead to a shortened life expectancy. The trisomy 21 uh, is more prevalent in older women, probably because of the age of the ova. Research shows that individuals with trisomy 21 have abnormal formations of their dendritic spines, making it more difficult to learn. And here is the three chromosomes on the 21st pair. The most frequent form of inherited intellectual disability today is fragile X syndrome. The DNA of this select chromosome seems more pinched and fragile, more likely to break off. The real uh, problem seems to be an excessively uh, repeated uh, trinucleotide that is in abundance four times normal, thus causing the extended appearance of the chromosome. And this is what the extended appearance of the chromosome is. This is an individual with uh, fragile X. And this is what their problem is, um, broad forehead, elongated face, uh, large prominent ears, uh, strabismus, they have crossed eyes, uh, highly arched palate in their mouths, uh, hyperextensible extensible, uh, joints that pop out from time to time, hand calluses uh, from rubbing their hands together, pectus uh, excavatum, uh, an indentation in their chest, the oddest thing you've ever seen. Mitral valve prolapse, uh, benign, it's a benign heart condition. Uh, in males, they have, an, they have enlarged testicles. Hypotonia, low muscle tone, soft fleshy skin, flat feet, and uh, about 10% of the time, they will have epilepsy. And as you can see, that's somebody who looks very similar to these guys. This is a brother and sister, and they both have fragile X. About 40% of children born to alcoholic mothers show a distinctive profile of anatomical, physiological, and behavioral impairments known as fetal alcohol syndrome. This is a baby with FAS. This is what a normal baby's brain looks like. This is, as you can see, it's much, much smaller. There are very few, uh, a much fewer convolutions uh, in the uh, in the brain structure. Children suffering with FAS show stunted growth and select facial anomalies, uh, small brain, small eye sockets, flat mid-face, 
distinct filter, indistinct filtrum. And filtrum is that uh, is that crease you have uh, in your nose, under your nose. Uh, thin upper lip, uh, small chin, short nose, lowered ears, low nasal bridge, epicanthic folds on the eyelids. Epicanthic folds are fat pads uh, underneath your your eyelids. Brain impairment is due to their small brain and brain structure problems like the almost absent corpus callosum, connection between the hemispheres of the brain, and reduction of cerebral cortical gyri, the folds in the brain that gives it more surface. Intellectual disability can be mild to severe, possibly depending on the time during pregnancy and the level of consumption of the mother. And this is a corpus callosum right here. Oops, I'm sorry. This is a corpus callosum right here. As you can see, it's quite distinctive. This is in a normal individual, and you can barely see this one right here. This is an individual with fetal alcohol syndrome. There's a reason why this is here. Um, normally, you can get a baby to hold still so that you can take an X-ray or take an MRI. This one, they had to they had to clamp the, the baby's head in place in order to get the MRI that they were looking for. And there you go. Wow. Besides intellectual disability, children with FAS also show more neurological abnormalities, abnormalities such as hyperactivity, irritability, tremulousness. Studies also seem to indicate that marijuana may have the same effects as alcohol. Autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong developmental di disorder that is characterized by slight to severe social impairment in language. 74% of children with uh, autism spectrum disorder develop poor language skills, rarely getting beyond monosyllabic responses and echolalia. Autism spectrum disorder doesn't have to correspond with any mental deficiency, but the lack of social interaction may impair the diagnosis. Normally, when an individual meets a stranger, they scan their faces for recognition and potentially put this information in their long-term memory. However, individuals with autism show brain scans where they seek no recognition and therefore have a difficult time making new acquaintances. Autism spectrum disorder seems to have something to do with brain organization. Practic uh, practically all information is organized differently from a normal control. Autism spectrum disorder seems to affect from one to two children per thousand. It is far more common among male children than female children and seems to run in families. Various areas of the brain show abnormalities among uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, children, including the corpus callosum. Autism spectrum disorder, formerly called Asperger's syndrome, seems to be a less severe form of autism spectrum disorder, or the individual does not suffer from language deficits but has problem with problems with social interactions. As people age, there seems to be a steady decline in brain size that begins as early as the 30s and begins to accelerate after age 45. However, the degree of decline seems to vary from individual to individual, from barely evident to exaggerated. Yet brain expansion seems to continue to occur as is evidenced by the presence of growth cones in the frontal lobe, even in the oldest individual. So no matter how old you are, you can still learn. As an individual enters their fifth decade, their hippocampal formation begins to shrink. The supratemporal gyrus also loses volume. In fact, most areas of the brain begin to lose volume. Over 4 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Oddly, the possibility of developing symptoms of Alzheimer's increases with age until the age of 85 and then starts to decline for those people who have never developed symptoms. Alzheimer's disease starts as a memory loss but progresses into greater and greater cognitive function, decline, cognitive decline until the individual can no longer carry on a conversation. Alzheimer's is accompanied by a marked cortical atrophy, especially on, in the frontal, temporal, and parietal, parietal areas. 
The brains of Alzheimer's patients show degeneration of axon terminals and dendrites caused by the buildup of beta amyloid forming senile plaque. Amyloid precursor protein is bound by two enzymes, beta secretase and presenilin. If one of these enzymes mutates, amyloid plaque builds up. <clears throat> Some cells show abnormalities called neurofibrillary tangles. These are tangles of the neurofilaments that are produced in abundance in the presence of the protein tau. Another gene mutation may allow Alzheimer's disease, APOE4, is supposed to break down the amyloid plaque, but is, it is less efficient than APO2 or APOE3 versions. With both amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles clogging the former functional neurons of the brain, the basal forebrain nuclei die, the cells that produce acetylcholine. The memory function of the brain dies with them. And we are going to watch a video. Maybe. My memory, I think, is good. I think it's good. But, I mean, I know the telephone numbers and my car and everything else. But sometimes it gets blurry. My memory? I think it's pretty good. But important things I don't seem to remember. If I could, I would be out of college. I was in denial about how bad the Alzheimer's was. But I saw it progressing. It was getting worse. He was sleeping more and more. Um, he was he was just like out of it sometimes. My dad was able to do everything, and now he's he's not he's able to barely care for himself. William and Harvey are just two of the 5.3 million people in the United States living with Alzheimer's disease, according to the Alzheimer's Association and a new case is diagnosed every 70 seconds. Alzheimer's disease is what we call a progressive neurodegenerative disease. And that's just a fancy way of saying that cells in the brain or neurons are dying because of the disease process. While no one really knows what causes Alzheimer's, some of the signs include impaired memory, restlessness, language deterioration, emotional apathy, impaired behavior, and confusion. And the family is great. We have two sons. And one is a PhD. My father, he used to own a gin mill. Then he went into the butcher shop and fixed it. And also, he wanted to burn soda around and people working for him. It was an interesting life. He made it interesting. So did my mother. Now I'm 92 years old. How about that? If memory changes lead to real functional problems, people are not recognizing people that they've known for years, people are forgetting how to get to places they've gone to for years, or people just aren't able to remember things that they used to be able to remember to the point that it's affecting their ability to live their life, to carry out their daily tasks, that's when it's time to seek the help of a professional. That's when Linda decided she needed some assistance. People would come to the house and he would just let them in. Strangers, perfect strangers, he would let into the house. And they would stay for hours. And I would worry that they'd be walking around my house, uh, you know, checking it out for later or possibly taking things. Or I didn't know, he was signing contracts for services that we didn't need. Now Linda takes Harvey to a special day center for Alzheimer's patients where he spends time with his new friend, William, and a dozen other patients. Both men are living more stimulating lives as the day center helps them to adjust to their future. Ta-da. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try another one. Maybe. There we go. Thank you. 
The human brain is a remarkable organ. Complex chemical and electrical processes take place within our brains that let us speak, move, see, remember, feel emotions, and make decisions. Inside a normal, healthy brain, billions of cells called neurons constantly communicate with one another. They receive messages from each other as electrical charges travel down the axon to the end of the neuron. The electrical charges release chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. The transmitters move across microscopic gaps or synapses between neurons. They bind to receptor sites on the dendrites of the next neuron. This cellular circuitry enables communication within the brain. Healthy neurotransmission is important for the brain to function well. Alzheimer's disease disrupts this intricate interplay. By compromising the ability of neurons to communicate with one another, the disease over time destroys memory and thinking skills. Scientific research has revealed some of the brain changes that take place in Alzheimer's disease. Abnormal structures called beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are classic biological hallmarks of the disease. Plaques form when specific proteins in the neuron's cell membrane are processed differently. Normally, an enzyme called alpha-secretase snips amyloid precursor protein, or APP, releasing a fragment. A second enzyme, gamma-secretase, also snips APP in another place. These released fragments are thought to benefit neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, the first cut is made most often by another enzyme, beta-secretase. That combined with the cut made by gamma secretase results in the release of short fragments of APP called beta amyloid. When these fragments clump together, they become toxic and interfere with the function of neurons. As more fragments are added, these oligomers increase in size and become insoluble, eventually forming beta amyloid plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles are made when a protein called tau is modified. In normal brain cells, Tau stabilizes structures critical to the cell's internal transport system. Nutrients and other cellular cargo are carried up and down the structures called microtubules to all parts of the neuron. In Alzheimer's disease, abnormal tau separates from the microtubules, causing them to fall apart. Strands of this tau combine to form tangles inside the neuron, disabling the transport system and destroying the cell. Neurons in certain brain regions disconnect from each other and eventually die, causing memory loss. As these processes continue, the brain shrinks and loses function. We now know a great deal about changes that take place in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, but there is still much to learn. What other changes are taking place in the aging brain and its cells? And what influence do other diseases, genetics, and lifestyle factors have on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as the brain and body age? Scientific research is helping to unravel the mystery of Alzheimer's and related brain disorders. As we learn more, researchers move ever closer to discovering ways to treat and ultimately prevent this devastating fatal disease. Ta -da. Okay, when I was uh, in the service, uh, I used to work with a pathologist who always took the brain out. <laughs> that was always the last thing that you did after an autopsy. You always took, the, well, if you were going to take the brain out, you took it out at the end. Um, and um, in, in a number of, of cases of Alzheimer's disease, the brain really is much, much smaller. Uh, than it than it normally is. So I saw this over and over again, working with this pathologist. Uh, you know, most autopsies took I don't know an hour, hour and fifteen minutes or so. But this guy, uh, he, it took forever. It, we were we were always in there for two, two and a half, three hours. It's really interesting. Whoops. And that's the end of the chapter, so I will talk to you guys next week. I think we're tackling two chapters next week, eight and, eight and nine. 
but this is always an interesting, an interesting chapter. So we'll see you next week.